Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time I'm delighted to be able to share with you another update on my collection of these beautiful penguin cloth bound classics designed by Coralie Bickford Smith. So since I last showed these, which was uh, just the tail end of last year, I have more than doubled my collection now. And I think I've got some absolutely beautiful books to share with you today. So without further ado, sit back, relax and let's get to it. So here's the first one, The Naked Lunch, William S. Burroughs. And this is a more modern title, relatively speaking. And um, I do hope that they do publish a few more books which aren't all sort of out of copyright classics. I hope they do do some which are perhaps Penguin Modern classics, uh, but in this beautiful format. Now, uh, this is one of the ones where they've dropped the sticker on the back now, and they've got the uh, the belly band, or in this case, the, uh, the back cover band. Um, there was some people who'd reported where, where is it? And we'll see some of these where there was a sticker on the back. When you peeled the sticker off, it would actually uh, take off some of the sort of indented cover gloss, uh, which are obviously these are books that are being bought um, not only as fantastic reading copies, but also to be really sort of saved and treasured. Um, certainly that's why I've got these because quite a, in fact, I would say more than 50% of these books I've already owned in some format anyway. Um, but the reason I'm buying them now is because these are just such beautiful editions and there are ones that I want to keep and, uh, and pass on. So uh, here we are. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm not um, trying to get these in first editions. They're very, very tough to find. And uh, um, well, you'd be on a, a very difficult search, but I'm very pleased to see this has got great page quality and uh, well, it's just a great, great edition. So what I thought we'd do, just in case you fancy picking up some of these, I will sort of read you the, the plot synopsis, the bit of um, publisher's blurb that's on the uh, the Penguin website um, as we go through these. And it may just tempt you to, to pick one of these up. So, nightmarish and fiercely funny, William Burroughs' virtuoso, taboo-breaking masterpiece, Naked Lunch, follows Bill Lee through Interzone, a surreal, organistic wasteland of drugs, depravity, political plots, paranoia, sadistic medical experiments, and endless gnawing addiction. One of the most shocking novels ever written, Naked Lunch is a cultural landmark, now in a restored edition, incorporating Burroughs' notes on the text, alternate drafts and outtakes from the original. So there we are. If that's what you're sort of looking for, <laughs> that would be uh, a great one to, to start. So uh, we will, of course, have a good look at these at the end. And they're all sort of in line. And uh, also in situ, I'll show you where I'm actually going to be uh, storing my cloth bound classics for the time being until I can get them their own sort of dedicated bookcase. So next one then is uh, The Outsider by Albert Camus, very, very thin novel. I think this is probably the thinnest uh, cloth bound classic that I've got and uh, really like the bright, vibrant pink and red colors on this one. Once again, it's got the belly band, red uh, end papers. Very, very nice indeed. It is quite a short, short novel, this one, but uh, no less a classic. There we are, so the little blurb about this one then. So in The Outsider, his classic existentialist novel, Camus explores the alienation of an individual who refuses to conform to social norms. Murasalt, his anti-hero, will not lie. When his mother dies, he refuses to show his emotions simply to satisfy the expectations of others. And when he commits a random act of violence on a sun-drenched beach near Algiers, his lack of remorse compounds his guilt in the eyes of society and the law. Yet he is much a victim as a criminal. So there you go. Very, very nice. Slide that one over there. Next, we've got a book that I must have in, in many, many editions. Now, this is one I got fairly recently from uh, Amazon. And when it arrived, I noticed that, and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this, but it's like it's got some rubbing or fingerprinting at the top and the bottom of the spine there. Now, I didn't want to just send it back. So one thing that I do a lot of on my channel and on my other channel, in actual fact, is repairing and cleaning sort of old books. And I thought one of the things I use as almost my stocking trade is a very soft rubber here, like this uh, little polymer one. And um, I'm hoping that with a gentle sort of rub, it may just pick these 
bits of dirt up, but I'm not going to guarantee it until I try it. Obviously, I don't want to make it any worse, but I think it's either a rub from the, the package that they came in because they weren't sort of protected, or it's just a very dirty fingerprint from someone maybe in the warehouse. This one's much more pronounced, so let's give this one a try. And I'm not sure if you can see it in nice detail there, but I don't want to rub away any of the red if I can help it. Well, I think that's not too bad. You can use the same technique. So if you find one of the books has got a big sort of fingerprint or a mark on the uh, on the, the page edge, you can just rub it off. And that, generally speaking, will uh, will take off any little marks like this. And this is a really handsome edition. It's obviously got both books in, Alice in Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, which is basically the way you should be reading it. Bright pink end papers. And it's got the original John Tenniel illustrations as well which are absolutely once again the key and classic way to read this book uh, all the books have got their own sort of tassel bookmark which is really nice although i have found that these do fray if you're not careful so once again treat all these books with the utmost care because um you know they are slightly susceptible so this is a perfect example where if you you know in a few sittings it's quite a large book in a few sittings if you read through that um over time the sort of uh the stalks here on the side would start to get worn down um i guess you could protect them with uh, archival wrap which um, i have seen some people do but it just wouldn't make them that comfortable to read and i love the texture of this cloth um sort of the cloth board so i think it's just a case of handle with care so anyway, this is the publisher's blurb for uh, Alice's and Winters Adventures in a Wonderland. So it says, I had sent my heroine straight down a rabbit hole without the least idea what was to happen afterwards, wrote Dodgson, who is actually Lewis Carroll, uh, describing how Alice was conjured up one golden afternoon in 1862 to entertain his child friend Alice Little. In the magical world of Wonderland and the back-to-front looking-glass kingdom, order is turned upside down. A baby turns into a pig, time is abandoned at a tea party, and a chaotic game of chess makes a seven-year-old a queen. Well, I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, the story of Alice in Wonderland, and uh, what a beautiful addition that is. Now we've got the, the first of two Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes books. Now, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan, so I do hope they go on to do uh, the rest of them, and I'm sure in time they will, but the actual output of these um, larger format cloth band classics, I think it's still a bit slow and the market I feel is there for them to be ramping up production because really it's only between three and five, maybe six a year um, when they could easily ramp it up to double that. Although there is an actual fact, a series of small like miniature uh, cloth band classics, which is due uh, very, very soon. Although yeah, looking through the list, there weren't that many titles that really sort of excited me, to be honest. But there you go. So this is a, a, an absolute favourite of mine. I'm a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. Um, this depicts um, uh, Moriarty, uh, sorry, Sherlock himself, uh, faking his death at the uh, Reichenbach Falls, um, a, a key moment in the last story of um, the uh, Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And just absolutely fantastic. Very, very nice. This one's got the introduction and it's got the notes, which I absolutely love. This is what we want. Great stuff. And if you've never read the original Holmes books, they do, they are of their time, but um, the actual stories are excellent and, uh, well, really, really recommended. So uh, the publisher's blurb on this one then is, this collection includes many of the famous cases and great strokes of brilliance that made the legendary Sherlock Holmes one of fiction's most popular creations. With his devoted Amunitis, Dr. Watson, Holmes emerges from his smoke-filled rooms in Baker Street to grapple with the forces of treachery, intrigue and evil in such cases as the Speckled Band, in which a terrified woman begs their help in solving the mysteries surrounding her sister's death, or a scandal in Bohemian, which portrays a European king blackmailed by his mistress. In Silver Blaze, the pair investigate the disappearance of a racehorse and the violent murder of its trainer, 
while in the final problem, Holmes at last comes face to face with his nemesis, the diabolical Professor Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime. Couldn't have put it better myself. What a fantastic, fantastic uh, volume this is. And, uh, well, it's just gorgeous. Really, really good. And, uh, yeah, a real favourite of mine, that one. So next, another Conan Doyle, The Hound of the Baskervilles. This is one of the standalone ones. And uh, once again, a real uh, treat for the eyes, this one. Beautiful uh, brown-coloured uh, tasseled bookmark to uh, keep in uh, sequence with the uh, with the actual book. Um, this one's got the sticker on, so I shall leave that one on rather than risk uh, delicately peeling it off to uh, to leave a mark. Great stuff here. Nice. It's got the introduction as well by uh, Holmes Experts. Further reading and a chronology. Christopher Frayling did the introduction to this one. He's a noted Sherlock Holmes expert. So let's redo the back for that one then. Could the sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville have been caused by the gigantic ghostly hound that is said to have haunted his family for generations? Arch rationalist Sherlock Holmes characteristically dismisses the theory as nonsense and, immersed in another case, he sends Dr Watson to Devon to protect the Baskerville heir and observe the suspects at close hand. With its atmospheric setting on the ancient wild moorland and its savage apparition, The Hound of the Baskervilles is one of the greatest crime novels ever written. Rationalism is pitted against the supernatural and good against evil, as Sherlock Holmes sets out to defeat a foe almost his equal. And it also says that this edition contains a full chronology of Arthur Conan Doyle's life and works, an introduction by renowned horror scholar Professor Christopher, Christopher Frayling, discussing the background to the novel and the legends and events that inspired the story, with further reading and explanatory notes. So, quite a comprehensive edition, this. And boy, oh boy, if only they did a little bit of backstory to each of these editions. But unfortunately, I have noticed that Penguin are, in most cases, using um, an edition that's already been uh, seen print earlier on, as possibly like a Penguin Modern Classic, for example, or a Penguin Classic, and they've just taken that exact text and uh, uh reprinted it in the uh, in the whole in the hardband cloth band not that that's a bad thing but it would have been nice to have had a little bit of exclusive content to make these even more special so charles dickens now i would love to get uh the rest of the charles dickens but um obviously they're not all out yet in cloth band form but he's an author i really do enjoy um the books are generally quite long although this is actually one of the shorter ones to be honest um as they were sort of originally written and published um, uh, monthly and um, I think they're they're really really great and they still stand up very very well today this is Hard Times one of my favorites of his and um, perhaps not the favorite but but a good one all the same um, I very much like Bleak House and um, Oliver Twist as well but there's there's so many good ones isn't there there really is but this is a, a beautiful edition of um, of Hard Times and this one's got the uh, the uh, the horse motif copied onto the belly band as well. Very very nice indeed. So, Coke Town is dominated by the figure of Mr. Thomas Gradgrind, school headmaster and model of utilitarian success. Feeding both his pupils and family with facts, he bans fancy and wonderful from any young minds. As a consequence, his obedient daughter, Louisa, marries the loveless businessman and bully of humanity, Mr. Bounderby, and his son Tom rebels to become embroiled in gambling and robbery. And as their fortunes cross with those of free-spirited circus girl, Sissy Jupe, and victimised weaver, Stephen Blackpool, Gradgrind is eventually forced to recognise the value of the human heart in an age of materialism and machinery. Brilliant, eh? And what fantastic and classic Dickens names in there. Oh, just so, so good. You can really sort of lose yourself in that world, can't you, when uh, when you read a Dickens? Now, here's another one of my favourites. I was really glad to uh, see this one have been uh, published, and that's Oliver Twist. Um, really, really nice. Uh, sort of a slightly off-white um, uh, cover on this one. It's not white, it's not grey. It's just like a little, a little off-white. Um, and the green is uh, once again uh, carried over into the front and back end papers. Very, very nice indeed. 
lengthy introduction. Um, Dickens has been studied and studied and studied. Um, so there's quite a bit there. And there's also appendixes at the end. So you can see uh, see what's what. They include the author's introduction to the third edition, which is cool, and the preface to the cheap edition. Um, and the glossary and the map of London. Basically, uh, it's ba it's like a reader's guide to this uh, uh, one of his all-time and most popular classics. The story of the orphan Oliver, who runs away from the workhouse only to be taken in by a den of thieves, shocked readers when it was first published. Dickens's tale of childhood innocence beset by evil depicts the dark criminal underworld of a London peopled by vivid and memorable characters. The arch-villain Fagin, the artful Dodger, the menacing Bill Sykes and the prostitute Nancy. Combining elements of gothic romance, the Newgate novel and popular melodrama, Dickens created an entirely new kind of fiction, scathing in its indictment of a cruel society and pervaded by an unforgettable sense of threat and mystery. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant, this. And, uh, well, it's a great... If you've never read it, I honestly... And you, but you know the story. I would honestly urge you to uh, give Oliver Twist a go because it is fantastic. So now moving on to uh, the biggest uh, book in the Clothbound Collectors that I own. But boy, oh boy, it's fantastic. And, uh, well, I haven't read it for a little while, but it's on my list of ones to be reread and revisited because it's just so good. Um, Alexander Dumas's uh, The Count of Monte Cristo just oh, it's so so good this one i just love it to death yes 1899 but look at the size of it it's a big big old book and uh it's worth every uh, penny in my opinion here yes uh just shy of um 1300 pages so it is a certainly a tome it's a commitment but what a satisfying story it's just fantastic and uh it's worth the effort it really really is so on the Penguin website, and this was one of the early ones, it says a beautiful new cloth-bound edition of Alexandre Dumas's classic novel of wrongful imprisonment, adventure and revenge. Thrown in prison for a crime he has not committed, Edmund Dantes is confined to the grim fortress of the Chateau d'If. There he learns of a great hoard of treasure hidden on the Isle of Monte Cristo and becomes determined to not only escape but to unearth the treasure and use it to plot the destruction of the three men responsible for his incarceration. A huge popular success when it was first serialised in the 1840s, Dumas was inspired by a real-life case of wrongful imprisonment when writing his epic tale of suffering and retribution. Absolutely fantastic. I couldn't have summed it up better myself. It's a real, real gem. So we're about halfway through this. So I'm going to get these sort of stood up, and then we're going to have a look at the second batch. Says so the first, just under half of my collection, and we've got pretty much that much to go through again. So, uh, without further ado, let's crack on. Now, another favourite, Madame Bovary, Gustave Flaubert. Now, this is, uh, well, it's a great, great book, this one. And I um, read this one, well, probably in my early 20s, and uh, absolutely loved it to death. It's really great. It's a bit of fun, um, but it's also... Uh, you know, when it was published, lots of uh, lots of people actually thought it was based on them, <laughs> apparently. Um, but it's a great, great book. I know it's got a lot of fans and um, really, really nice edition here with the uh, the purple and the pink. It really goes well together, doesn't it? Very, very nice indeed. So let's look at the blurb on this one. So it says, Emma Bouverie is beautiful and bored, trapped in her marriage to a mediocre doctor and stifled by the banality of provincial life. An ardent reader of sentimental novels, she longs for passion and seeks escape in fantasies of high romance, in voracious spending and eventually in adultery. But even her affairs bring her disappointment and the consequences are devastating. Flaubert's erotically charged and psychologically acute portrayal of Emma Bovary caused a moral outcry on its publication in 1857. It was deemed so lifelike that many women claimed that they were the model for his heroine, but Flaubert insisted, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. <laughs> Can you believe it? Beautiful, beautiful edition, excellent stuff. So next we've got, I believe it's probably the most modern book on the list, uh, A Confederacy of Dunces, John Kennedy Toole. This one's got the uh, the hot dog, motif on the front and sort of dripping mustard there which is pretty cool isn't it <laughs> arguably uh, a modern day classic it is a, a penguin modern classic i believe this one got a four by walker percy there 
And you can see that this is actually a different typeface to some of the other ones that we've been looking at because I believe they've taken the Penguin Modern Classics Edition and they've just popped it into the cloth bound, um, this cloth bound edition. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that at all. Um, it would be just nice to, if it was perhaps uh, possibly reset, you know, but hey ho. So here's the publisher's blurb. A monument to sloth, rant and contempt. A behemoth of fat, flatulence and furious suspicion of anything modern. This is Ignatius J. Riley of New Orleans, noble crusader against a world of dunces. The ordinary folk of New Orleans seem to think he is unhinged. Ignatius ignores them, heaving his vast bulk through the city's flesh pots in a noble crusade against vice, modernity and ignorance. But his mama has a nasty surprise in store for him. Ignatius must get a job. Undaunted, he uses his newfound employment to further his mission. And now he has a pirate costume and a hot dog cart to do it with. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. It is a, a, a modern classic, that one, and uh, one that you may well want to uh, track down. I just wish that they did something, uh, did a few more of these more modern ones, you know. Um, and certainly, you know, there, there's several that come to mind that Penguin Stroke Random do have the rights for. I mean, what about doing, say... I don't know, Casino Royale, for example, or maybe a few more of the uh, John Wyndham's. I don't know. I don't know who makes the decisions, but um, it would be nice since they published the majority of the really classic classics, something like this, for example, that they do perhaps cast an eye over the more recent uh, releases. Not to take anything away from Moby Dick, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. I read it again recently, first time in perhaps 30 years, and absolutely loved it. This edition, once again, it is straight, it's straight, it's the Penguin Classics edition. It's not been reset, and it's slightly, slightly um, galling on the eye compared to um, other editions that I've seen out there. So that is a slight shame, but it's quite an easy read, the chapters are short. And although it's a big book, it is super enjoyable and if you've never ever read it i recommend it so here's what it says on the publisher's website in herman melville's moby dick captain ahab is an eerily compelling madman who focuses his distilled hatred and suffering and that of generations before him into the pursuit of a creature as vast dangerous and unknowable as the sea itself more than just a novel of adventure this is a haunting social commentary populated with some of the most enduring characters in literature. Written with wonderfully redemptive humour, Moby Dick is a profound and timeless inquiry into character, faith and the nature of perception. Well, that is an interesting way to look at it, I suppose. Um, I don't think I would have described it like that. All I will say is if you manage to get through the book, um, as I say, it's not that difficult to read um, and make it to the end, uh, you will know every last detail about uh, whaling uh, when, the, when the book was written. And it's not that pleasant a subject i can tell you that but the actual story and everything about it and like they say the characters is is really really something so next an unbridled classic and um you know all the george orwells now are out of copyright so any publisher can come up with them and um since it's over 70 years since um the author's death um They've done Animal Farm and they've done 1984, which we'll see in a minute. The next one I'd love them to do is um, Down and Out in Paris and London, which is my favourite um, George Orwell of all. Um, so hopefully that will come very, very soon. But this is a very, very nice edition. Perhaps this is the thinnest one, actually. Now I think about it in the, uh, the Cloth Band Classics. Yeah, 120 pages. This is a real beauty. Everything about it is, is gorgeous. I really like the, uh, the, t the size of the print. It's a great, great read, this one. And if you're going to read Animal Farm, why wouldn't you want to read this particular edition? It's just gorgeous um, in every way and only 12 99 So let me read you the back of this. When the downtrodden animals of Manor Farm overthrow their master, Mr. Jones, and take over the farm themselves, they imagine that it is the beginning of a life of freedom and equality. But gradually, a cunning, ruthless elite among them, masterminded by the pigs, Napoleon and Snowball, starts to take control. Soon the other animals discover that they are not as all equal as they thought and find themselves hopelessly ensnared as one form of tyranny is replaced with another. Orwell's chilling fairy story is a timeless and devastating satire of idealism betrayed by power and corruption. 
there we are and um, well, I do always forget that animal farm and then a fairy story is, is like the the subtitle of that particular one now perhaps his most famous book is this one which is uh 1984 um great great design on this one once again mine has um sadly suffered it's got a little bit of wear um on the black here um it is a shame but uh, i guess it's an earlier edition and um this black does seem even more susceptible than some of the other colors um but, but there you go it's a great book doesn't take anything away from the book and uh it is uh, recommended, of course, if you've never read 1984, there's uh, a lot to still enjoy in this one. And uh, this is a really handsome edition, of course. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Hidden away in the record department of the sprawling Ministry of Truth, Winston Smith skillfully rewrites the past to suit the needs of the party. Yet he inwardly rebels against the totalitarian world he lives in, which demands absolute obedience and controls him through the all-seeing telescreens and the watchful eye of Big Brother, symbolic head of the party. In his longing for truth and liberty, Smith begins a secret love affair with a fellow worker, Julia, but soon discovers the true price of freedom is betrayal. George Orwell's dystopian masterpiece, 1984, is perhaps the most persuasively influential book of the 20th century. And you would be quite hard pressed to argue against that, wouldn't you, to be honest? But it's uh, yeah, a very, very nice book indeed. Now, the next one is what I think perhaps one of the most gorgeous of the entire line so far. Now, this is also the first book where the actual cover illustration is not indented so it's like screen printed on so this hopefully i believe is an attempt to stop the covers rubbing as badly as some of them have been uh, which i think is fantastic so that's good news once again it's got the belly uh, belly band there and uh, as you can see this one is really really gorgeous um got all the original illustrations in there and also almost like a making of how it came to get printed so uh, it's a very, very nice, uh, very nice edition, this one. And uh, I think it's one that would be uh, gratefully received sort of as a gift, you know. Anton de Saint-Exupéry first published The Little Prince in 1943, only a year before his plane vanished over the Mediterranean during a, re a reconnaissance mission. Nearly 80 years later, this fable of love and loneliness has lost none of its power. The narrator is a downed pilot in the Sahara Desert, frantically trying to repair his wrecked plane. His efforts are interrupted one day by the apparition of a little prince who asks him to draw a sheep. In the face of an overpowering mystery, you don't dare disobey, the narrator recalls. Absurd as it seems, a thousand miles from all inhabited regions and in danger of death, I took a scrap of paper and pen out of my pocket, and so begins their dialogue which stretches the narrator's imagination in all sorts of surprising, childlike directions. There we go, very, very nice indeed, that one. Let's slide him over there. And as I said, makes a really, really nice present, that particular one. Excellent stuff. I love this book. Um, I loved it when I was a child. Uh, Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. I love the light sort of uh, coral, coral blue here. Matched with the matching end paper is really, really nice. This one's also got quite a lengthy introduction, which is good news. And um, it has got some illustrated plates that so we might be hard pushed to find them just by flicking through. And there is one, I believe. Yeah, just give you sort of a few maps as well, dotted throughout the uh, throughout the text. Lovely white little white tassel bookmark there. I'll slide that one in there. So shipwrecked and cast adrift, the moor Gulliver wakes to find himself on Lilliput, an island inhabited by little people whose height makes their quarrels over fashion and fame seem ridiculous. His subsequent encounters with the crude giants of Brobningnag and philosophical Hoyumhims and brutish yahoos give Gulliver new bitter insights into human behaviour. Swift's savage satire views mankind in a distorted hall of mirrors as a diminished magnified and finally bestial species 
presenting us with an uncompromising reflection of ourselves. Well, there we are. That was a bit of a tongue twister, wasn't it? But, but I'm sure you all know the story of Gulliver's Travels, and it's an absolute uh, classic and uh, one which uh, everyone deserves to read. So Jules Verne's is around the world in 80 days. Now this one has got one of the most, I think, extravagant designed covers of all because it's got the different like stamps where uh, uh, Phineas Fogg lands on his journey where he visits. Um, I think it's really, really great. It's a, a beautiful edition of this one. And uh, yeah, this was uh, one of the very earliest ones I collected. It's got the classic introduction by um, SF author Brian Aldiss as well, as well as some other bits and pieces and notes on the translation. So nice that it's got the additional pieces, which I always love. It's almost like a DVD extra, isn't it, when you get those on a classic book? So, one night in the Reform Club, Phileas Fogg bets his companions that he can travel across the globe in just 80 days. Breaking the well-established routine of his daily life, he immediately sets off for Dover with his astonished valet, Pas Papant. Passing through exotic lands and dangerous locations, they seize whatever transportation is at hand, whether train or elephant, overcoming setbacks and always racing against the clock. Good stuff. And uh, the most recent uh, David Tennant adaption, or adaptation, TV adaptation of, uh, of that was also well, well worth a look. So the next one is... Uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is my favourite Jules Verne. Now, this has got quite an interesting um, jacket because it's got the, the very dark black and then like the Dago, Dago yellow of like the jellyfish here, which is unusual. Um, the black carries on inside, and I guess, is it like representing the blackness of the deep, of the deeps of the ocean? Um, very happy to see that we've got some of the original illustrations that were used, and these were the books that I read. I used to have like a um, an omnibus when I was a kid of the uh, of five classic Jules Verne novels and this was always the one I absolutely loved and uh, you know the descriptions of the Nautilus and travelling under sea are just superb and uh, this one's got quite a bit to it it's a long book this one and uh, it's good to see it's got nice uh, lots of introductions and um, like a lot of the books around this period the chapters are actually quite short so don't be put off by the size of it because you can just dip in and out um, until you've worked your way through it is well well worth it in this thrilling adventure tale by the father of science fiction three men embark on an epic journey under the sea with the mysterious captain nemo aboard his submarine the nautilus over the course of their fantastical voyage they encounter the lost city of atlantis the south pole and the corals of the red sea and must battle countless adversaries, both human and monstrous. Verne's triumphant work of the imagination shows the limitless possibilities of science and the dark depths of the human mind. Great stuff, eh? Very, very nice indeed. And we've still got a couple more still to go here. And they've done the War of the Worlds. Um, but this is the only uh, H.G. Wells so far. Um, I'm hoping that they do... Uh, the Time Machine and the Invisible Man. Um, they would be two that would be sort of fairly high up on my list of ones. I wouldn't mind seeing them produce. This is a lovely, uh, lovely cover here. I guess it's showing the comets coming from Mars. This one's got the um, introduction, a few biographical notes. I think this is lifted straight from the Penguin Classics. Um, and once again, just popped into the... Uh, beautiful hardback form here so it says from the planet of war they came to conquer the earth the night after a shooting star is seen streaking across the sky a cylinder is discovered on Horsell common fascinated and exhilarated the local people approach the mysterious object armed with nothing more than a white flag but when gruesome alien creatures emerge armed with an all-destroying heat rays their rashness turns rapidly to fear as the rays blaze towards them, it soon becomes clear they have no choice but to flee or die. The forces of the earth, however, may prove harder to beat than they at first appear. Great stuff. Cannot beat the War of the Worlds. It's an all-time absolute classic. And uh, I think Wells is very much due a bit of a revival. Maybe not you know beyond the, the more obvious ones. Because um, there are some... He was very prolific and there's lots of other works that maybe could use a bit of a revival. 
The last one, Wyndham's Dare the Triffids, and uh, in my top five books of all, absolutely love this one. And uh, if you've never read it, it comes heartily recommended. Um, so this is a really nice edition of it, but once again, it has been lifted straight from uh, the most recent sort of modern classics edition. And it does come with um, an introduction um, by Barry Langford, which actually isn't great. And I spoke to my friend Steve, the Outlaw books there, who also didn't enjoy the introduction. I don't know what it is about it. It's just so dry. There's no enthusiasm at all. And uh, it's such a shame for a book which is fantastic. And uh, I believe, you know, it needs to stay in the public eye. Um, but that introduction is enough to put you off reading it, to be honest. But that's just my opinion. But this is a, a gorgeous, gorgeous edition of um, perhaps my favourite book of all time. So when Bill Mason wakes up blindfolded in hospital, there is a bitter irony in his situation. Carefully removing his bandages, he realises that he is the only person who can see. Everyone else, doctors and patients alike, have been blinded by a meteor shower. Now, with civilization in chaos, the Triffids, huge, venomous, large-rooted plants able to walk, feeding on human flesh, can have their day. There we are. Says it all, really, doesn't it? Absolutely fantastic. So let's get these all out and have a look at them en masse, as it were. So there they all are, and don't they look absolutely fantastic? So I very much prefer to just do these by A to Z by the author's surname. Um, I have seen many, many people sort of put them on their shelves almost by colour, um, and they do look very beautiful. I, I won't argue with that, but I just prefer to have them uh, strictly A to Z, and I guess that's just the uh, the bibliophile in me. Um, so... I hope you have enjoyed looking through those. I um, absolutely enjoy them myself, and uh, I think they're just a delight to collect. They really, really are. And um, I'm still going to try and keep on uh, picking up one or two a month as the uh, as I go through the titles. Although, out of the 90 that they produced, and I've not even got a quarter of them yet, looking through the list, there's not, you know, there's not that many more that I'm really, really looking to get. Um, you know, maybe another 10 or 20 or so. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how we go on there. Uh, great things to ask for is presents. So uh, with the birthday coming up, we'll see uh, see what, what more I can get added to the collection. Anyway, I do hope you've enjoyed looking through my collection today. It would be really interesting to note in the comments if there's any particular titles that you would like to see, like to see made into a... Uh, penguin cloth band classics um as i said my feeling is i'd like them to produce a few more modern books and i have mentioned a few as we've been going through a few more windhams um a couple more george orwells wouldn't go amiss uh, maybe a james bond i mean how exciting would that be to do say a casino royale for example so i think there has to be um room if the rights are there to do a few more modern books alongside some some more of the classics the rest of the conan doyles a few more charles dickens i don't think would go amiss anyway thank you very much for watching today if you've enjoyed it do please give the video a thumbs up and do please hit the subscribe button if you've not already for regular vintage book and paperback content and i look forward to seeing you again very soon bye